Ah. Naruto exclaimed, climaxing again. What number it was he couldn't say, as he'd lost count. Naruto kissed his lover, deeply as he slowly withdrew from her, it took a great deal of effort, to roll off her. Both bodies were covered in a light sheen. He was tired. More tired than he'd possibly ever been. Or if not more, at least different. He felt drained, depleted, but wholly satisfied. He knew he was grinning like an idiot. If he could have stopped, he would have. Kukuku, he heard as he felt Orochi pull closer to him, wrapping her arms around him, and he returned the gesture. He fought to open his eyes, at the moment he'd have sworn he'd uprooted trees, with greater ease, but he did manage it, partially. The half-lidded gaze of the Uzumaki, met the Sanans. He stole a glance at the alarm clock over her shoulder, it proudly displayed the time of a quarter after five. He really needed to get a few hours before he reported in for the day. Naruto-kuen? Hmm, he hummed, sleepily. You said you hadn't mastered Koton, what did you mean by that? Naruto fought back a yawn before answering, it's like with the basic elements. You learn how to mold your chakra to perform it and for a while, you always have to consciously mold your chakra in that way. It's as if there is a disconnect, and you are making your chakra produce fire, wind, or whatever. After you gain enough experience with the release, that transition seems to disappear, and you don't feel like you're transforming your chakra you're just producing katan chakra. Your body and mind know how to do it. I haven't gotten to that reflexive stage with Kotan yet. Hmm, so with my Jitan, I just need more experience, and it'll start to feel natural? Yep. Orochimaru smiled at the response, as that was an obstacle she'd yet to overcome. She can control the iron sand, but it took a good deal of effort, it hadn't felt natural yet, and she didn't know if it ever would. It seemed she simply needed to train it more, condition the yin and the yang of her body to accept the transformation, so she could expand on her abilities. It makes sense, why he only had one lava and ice jutsu when she trained him, creating more jutsu before he'd mastered the release was accepting a shoddy foundation. And how many sub-elements have you mastered to your standards? Depends on who's asking, my rival, or my girlfriend? Girlfriend? She asked teasingly. I'm too sleepy to be embarrassed, Naruto observed, causing the Sanin to giggle. How am I to know when I am one, the other or both, she asked, pulling even closer into their embrace. Mem, when we're naked, let's not be rivals, Naruto offered. Orochimaru laughed into his chest. I'll consider it. Now, if you could answer my original question. Naruto leaned down and whispered in her ear, a look of surprise, giving way to a sultry smirk. Swiftly, Naruto found himself on his back. Kukuku, it appears you won't be getting any sleep just yet, Naruto Kuen, she said as Naruto felt her slide down his body. He really hoped she wasn't suggesting another spar, because there was no way that was going to be possible. Naruto's worries were nullified when he felt an intense and welcome sensation. He, shakily, sucked in a breath air, while clutching his crimson sheets. He peeked toward the end of the bed, and the bobbing of his girlfriend's head, was confirmation. Sleep would not be coming soon, he thought, but he wouldn't complain. Naruto took another look down. No, no complaints at all. Shino considered himself unflappable. It was as much his personality as it was discipline, but he could remain calm through almost anything. However, one could forgive him for having difficulty with the weirdness that was his morning breakfast. In the Uzumaki Manor, there were two primary places to eat, the first was a large, ornate dining hall. A large room with a 15-person table, crystal chandelier, and walls, decorated with red Uzumaki spirals. None of the three current Uzumaki were much for formality so the room was rarely used, Naruto explained it as more of a promise to the future. One day, maybe a generation or two from now, that table would be full. The second place was the kitchen, a generously sized room itself. Dual wall-mounted ovens, side-by-side -side refrigerator covered with blackboard paint, induction range. In the center laid an island with even more kitchen gadgets, including a grill, atop of it was an industrial hood. Also, seals. So many seals. It was absurd. Within the kitchen resided two places to sit while eating, either at the end of the island, where one would sit atop bar stools, or the six-person, circular dining table with wood bay windows. Seals on the windows made them tint should the sun get too bright. Shino was sitting at the island, eating oatmeal with blueberries, along with Tayuya, who was eating the same. Karen was enjoying some steamed cod with rice and miso soup. 
that was fairly normal as the trio had shared breakfast countless times before, Karen never making a deal out of Shino being there while also managing to be welcoming. No, the weirdness was contained at the table, as sitting across from each other were two of the three Sanin. Orochimaru, looking freshly showered, hair pulled up, and wearing a pale purple kimono was absent-mindedly dining on an arugula, walnut and pear salad, humming a tune. Jiraiya, enjoying a steak with some rice, and miso soup was scowling at the woman as he cut through his steak. It was clear to Shino that Orochimaru had spent the night here, and mated with his teammate. That fact must have been clear to Jiraiya as well, it displeased him greatly. Really now, Jiraiya, what have I done to deserve such a hard luck? You couldn't even wait a day? What difference would it have made? Orochimaru asked before breaking out into a face-splitting grin, besides, he didn't protest. Which reminds me, Karen-chan? Yes, Orochimaru-sama? Naruto-kun might need a bit of chemical pick-me-up. Okay, I'll whip something right up, Karen said, going to the cabinet, to get a mortar and pestle. She grabbed several ingredients, but Shino's attention was pulled back toward the Sanin. Would you have stopped if he had? Jiraiya questioned, and Orochimaru shrugged. Irrelevant. We both got what we wanted, so I wouldn't entertain any ideas of changing that if I were you. If I stay out of this, it certainly wouldn't be because I fear you. And stop telling people you're the strongest of the Sanin. I'm a damn sage, I'm stronger than you and Tsunade both. And before you get quippy, I fought the kid full on, and if your little show last night was anywhere near your best, you're a distant number two. No need to speculate, Jiraiya. We can test your hypothesis whenever you want, or tomorrow offered. I think Abakan would throw a temper tantrum for the ages if you two wrecked her training grounds, Tabeo, said Naruto, lazily, but with an underlining of humor. He had a soft smile and closed eyes as he shuffled into the kitchen, black t-shirt clinging to his hastily dried body. Naruto, Karen greeted. They'd missed each other yesterday, but the medic was happy to see her cousin again. Here, take these with water, and a little food, Karen handed the pills she'd just finished making, placing them in his palm. He gave her a one-arm hug, while thanking her. He continued on, retrieving a glass and filling it with water. Yuya-chan, you are certainly looking luminescent this morning. I hope you're taking good care of Shino. Fuck you, stump, Tayuya fired back, getting a laugh in response. Morning, Shino. Same to you, Naruto, the Abure mare replied. Naruto finally made it to the table, sitting by Orochimaru. Good morning, Oroki-chan. Good morning, yourself. I figured you'd still be asleep. I wish, I have to report to Tsunade Abakan in an hour to officially start as an elite tutor, Naruto said with zero enthusiasm. Not that teaching was a waste of his talents, it just simply held no interest to teach people who probably didn't like him. Poor thing, Orochimaru, in mock sympathy. Yes, I'm a pitiable figure if there ever was one. Cursed by the very gods themselves, Naruto replied with great effort. He ingested the pills and drank the water. Well, maybe the day won't be all bad. It can't be, I have a hot date tonight, Naruto declared. Oh, really? Should I be jealous? I wouldn't blame you if you were, she's pretty amazing. Please, get a room, Jiraiya cut in. He knew he had to accept this abomination of a relationship, but he felt no need to actually watch it. His godson rolled his eyes, likely recalling all the times Jiraiya got sloppy with some woman while Naruto had to go busy himself. Said godson then placed his right hand on the table and channeled some chakra. Most of the onlookers gaped when they watched a small tree sprout from the table, maturing until it bore fruit. Naruto picked the gala apple off a miniature limb, winking at Orochimaru, as he bit into it. What the actual fuck was that? Tayuya asked, slash shouted, managing to summarize what most of the others present. I was told to eat, I wanted an apple so I got an apple, Naruto said, completely ignoring the justified shock of those around him. In truth, he knew he was showing off, but if simply telling Orochimaru what he could do resulted in that, he was curious what a casual demonstration of power and prowess might net. Looking into her eyes, he concluded it'd be mind-bendingly awesome. A gentle hand on his whiskered cheek and Orochimaru leaning forward was all the warning he got before being pulled into a kiss. A simple lip lock escalating into more, to Jiraiya's dismay. Hmm, I should leave, Orochimaru whispered, and got up from the table. Karen-chan, Tayuya-chan, let's see what kind of trouble we can get into today. The two female Uzumaki nodded and followed their mistress out of the kitchen. 
Naruto turned back around to see Jiraiya, frowning at him. What now? How long have you been able to do the apple tree trick? Long enough, why? Naruto asked in genuine confusion. Because all those days I was hungover, and you made me go get some food. You could have just given me a damn apple you brat. Jiraiya explained before laughing. You seem pretty accepting of this, Naruto pointed out. You're going to do what you want to do. Do I have my concerns? Yes, I won't lie to you about that, but I'm going to trust you and hope for the best. But no, if this is some scheme and you get hurt, I'll kill her. Even if I have to die to do it. Naruto nodded. Jiraiya didn't often make threats, but he carried them out when he did, Naruto had seen it personally. Now, on to more important things, how was it? Jiraiya smoothly dodged the red spike of death that shot toward him, Naruto's hair returning to normal, in an instant. Even Shino facebombed at that. Jiraiya laughed at the boy's response. All five of the great hidden villages will have teams in attendance, Hokage-sama, Shikamaru stated. Tamari and he were in the final stages of planning for the Chunin exams, which was vetting all the participants and their sensei. It was a tedious but necessary process, made even more so because of the weight of these exams. The first Kiri teams since the resolution of the civil war would be on display. Kumo may use the exams to kill up incoming ninja from Kanoha and Suno, while also attempting to show IWA who they should be allied with. After the Team Kurinai reunion, Shikamaru stayed up all night to finish the planning. The exam started in a month, which meant the Kagya would be traveling to Suna in two. He just wanted to be done with the whole damn thing and go back to cloud watching and shogi playing. The only other bit of information we need is to know your guardian detail for the finals. Archi and Kakashi, the Godame answered, and Shikamaru nodded. Is there anything else? No, Hokage-sama, the lazy Nara, answered. Good, for the time you will be returning to Team Asuma and your regular Chunin duties. Thank you for your service, Shikamaru. You are dismissed, Tsunade said. Shikamaru bowed and exited the office. As Shikamaru walked down the hallway, passing the various ninja waiting to meet with the Godame, he sees his two teammates chatting away. What are you two doing here? I'm here to meet Tsunade Abakan, Naruto answered, still dragging as the pills Karen gave him hadn't kicked in yet. He briefly remembered never asking her what was in them and resolved to not swallow pills given to him without asking a few questions. I'm here for moral support, Shino said. Shikamaru bit out a laugh. Oh, that starts today? I'm guessing you don't know who you'll be babysitting. Not at all. Man, I'm supposed to be out there, kicking ass, and saving princesses. It's a statistical anomaly that we have saved as many as we have, Shino observed. It's also troublesome. Stop looking a gift horse in the mouth. Shika, you need a greater sense of adventure, Naruto teased but grew confused when Shikamaru took him by the shoulders and looked him square in the eyes. Naruto, boring is good. Boring means stable, peaceful. Embrace the boring. Adventure is for storybooks. I think he'll be too busy embracing something else, Shino stated. Naruto was called into the Hokage's office, before he could respond. So. Embracing something else? Shikamaru asked. Yes, Shino answered. He works fast, the Nara observed. Or she does, the Aburim countered. Good point. Should we be concerned? Maybe about his exhaustion levels. As for everything else, I suggest we wait and see. I'll try to think up some contingencies, but... I understand. The two nodded at each other and then broke out into matching grins. So, she exhausted him? Outside of hours of fighting, I didn't think it possible. There were other developments best not spoken about here. Team training tomorrow morning. The slight inflection told Shikamaru this was serious. He affirmed he understood then departed the Hokage Tower, Shino leaving to attend to his own matters. As Naruto reached for the door to the Hokage's office, he felt a wave of energy rush through his body, which was followed by a very brief but very painful headache. It left as fast as it came and the Uzumaki no longer felt drained. He resolved to thank Karen later. Naruto entered Tsunade's office, finding himself wrapped in a hug with Tsunade saying, I couldn't greet you probably yesterday. So I'm making up for lost time. She released him soon after and returned to her seat. Now, down to business, I know you aren't thrilled about your assignment, but you can best serve the village by sharing your knowledge. 
Most days you'll have one charge, Tsunade paused to toss him a scroll, as she requested you personally. It's a fraught situation, so handle it with a measure of diplomacy. There will also be times I'll have you help our forces with some training seminars. Naruto nodded. He knew nothing he could say would change it, so he'd just have to accept it. Now, there is one more thing. Team Karinai is put on hold, as all three of you were simply better served elsewhere, but there was also a problem that none of you have any medical training. You will be sending a clone to the hospital to get some basic training. Why me? Naruto asked. He didn't mind, and Irio Ninjutsu was a blank spot in his knowledge, but this just seemed odd. Both Shino and Shika have the chakra control and intelligence for it. Shika isn't a frontline fighter, and Shino has extensive knowledge of anatomy, due to his hunter ninja training. They've also been here, and could have easily been certified so why me? Tsunade bit her lip and looked away, it was simply decided you'd be the best fit for the training. Naruto looked at Tsunade in puzzlement. She was clearly lying, and wasn't even trying hard to hide the fact. It didn't make sense, he had to follow her orders, regardless, and he'd do it anyway since she was family. And she might even show him something if he learned enough. That's when a light bulb turned on. You aren't jealous that I've learned things from each of the Sanin, but you, are you? Naruto asked, smiling. Tsunade donned an embarrassed blush at being caught. Medical ninjutsu is just as cool as other ninjutsu, and you can do a lot with it. I don't deny that, Obachan. But there is another reason. I saw you spar with Orochi, I know you've gotten really good over the last three years, but if war breaks out you're going to be a primary target. When I learns, you aren't so easy to kill, he'll target those you care about. Add that to your tendency of throwing yourself in front of threats, and you can see my concern. My grandfather was excellent at self-healing. I could never manage to replicate it, but with the advanced healing offered by the QB, I was hoping you could. Naruto didn't know what to say, he could tell her worry ran deeper than just his welfare, but how it would only compound the grief she felt of previous losses. He didn't like seeing her like that, it felt wrong. Naruto smiled largely and brightly, don't worry, Obachan. I'll go through the training, and whatever you want to show me. I can't die until I take that seat, Tabeo. Tsunade smiled in return, perked up, by his declaration of taking her position. I can't wait, Naruto, but don't be in too big a rush. Enjoy your youth while you can and then come rescue me from this chair and the paperwork. Deal? Deal. Good, now go meet your new student and try not to cause an incident. Diplomacy and discretion are my middle name, Naruto said, attempting to pacify the Godame, but her rolling her eyes let him know he'd failed. Just do your best, now scram. I am not a house cat, Tabeo. Naruto said, departing through the window just to annoy his surrogate aunt. The Uzumaki clan head landed on the ground and then blurred to his destination, arriving near instantly to the Hyuga clan compound. Naruto presented his mission scroll to the exterior guards and was promptly escorted in. As they walked, Naruto could feel more and more people watching him. The Uzumaki wanted to roll his eyes. Yes, that kid is here. Hide your wives, hide your children, he thought, dismissively. Naruto was led down a few more corridors, before finally reaching his destination. The Hyuga slid back a door and ushered Naruto into an outdoor training ground, with two people in attendance. The older Hyuga, obviously Hayashi, seemed tired and worn. The younger Hyuga, Hanabi, looked resolute. When Hayashi realized who was there he simply left, sparing no words for Naruto, but the Uzumaki didn't mind. He sized up his new student. The girl had certainly grown from the tiny thing she was. She'd cut her hair at some point, it styled in a bob and with her charcoal-colored GI, she was clearly ready to train. Hello, Hanabi, Naruto said. Hello, Naruto-san, the now heiress replied back, but Naruto waved the honorific off. I have to admit, I was a little surprised to learn you'd be my primary student. Not that I mind, of course, but I am curious as to why the Hyuga heiress would want outside training. Hanabi had suspected he'd ask that and was prepared with an answer. My Nechan told me the one thing she wanted from me more than anything else was to be the kind of Hyuga I wanted to be. My clan is not just prideful in their traditions and legacy, but arrogant. It's made us stagnate. Even the removal of the seal hasn't fixed it as now the former branch members are just free to flaunt their clan membership to the rest of the village. While they revel in their pride, they do not see the concrete ceiling they've erected above their heads. No S-rank ninja to our name, no Hyuga ever considered a candidate for Hokage, and few if any innovations to our primary fighting style. 
We're capable of more but too many are blind to it, chained to the habits of the past, Hanabi had to pause to breathe in and out, the frustration with her clan, with how they treated her sister. It felt so heavy, the inescapable weight of it all. Hanadane, she wasn't naturally good at gentle fist, but worked around it. She developed herself and found alternative uses for her bloodline. Almost no one praised her for it, they could only see the break in tradition. I want to be like her, a Hyuga in my own way, following my own path. Naruto smiled, that's a good goal, Hanabi. How can I help? You can help me unlearn the gentle fist. Jiraiya sighed as he sank into the comfortable leather chair. He made a mental note to talk to Naruto about getting a few for the matter. He looked around the room, Hiruzen's study. It felt odd being here, he'd rarely spoken to his sensei outside the Hokage's office, so this felt unfamiliar. Adding to the dissonance was that his sensei wasn't the Hokage anymore. A scenario neither man had much time adjusting to the first time it happened and three years away hadn't allowed the reality to sink in. A cough brought his attention back to Hiruzen and his reason for being here. I want you to call it off, Sensei, Jiraiya said, his tone was resigned, he hadn't come here to fling accusations or relive the past or anything like that. He just needed the elder Sarutobi to stop. Call what off, Jiraiya? Whatever plan you have, whatever new stage in this sick little game you're playing with her needs to end. If she goes off the deep end, if she crosses the Lineheim and I will stop her. Your involvement isn't necessary, Jiraiya argued. Hiruzen's glare could have melted glaciers. My involvement is the sole reason we know what she did last time. I have not planned anything but I will not be treated like some doddering old man, especially not by one of my students, Hiruzen exclaimed in offense. Jiraiya simply scoffed. And yet you didn't manage to stop Danzo, so clearly your vision isn't all-seeing, Jiraiya retorted. Hiruzen didn't react, visibly, but internally he winced. His permissiveness with Danzo was one of his great shames and, apparently, made him look like a hypocrite with how diligent he was to uproot Orochimaru. You have to know she cannot be trusted, Hiruzen said in a much more subdued tone. You're probably right, Sensei. Hell, more than probably, but you've yet to discover anything, not that you've been looking, Jiraiya finished, sarcastically. If it were just a matter between you two, I wouldn't care. You both enjoy your little games, that's fine. It isn't just between you two, and I won't let Naruto get dragged down because you're fixated on her. I am doing this for him, Hiruzen protested, clearly offended. Well, judging by what I witnessed this morning, you're too late, Jiraiya shared, mortifying Hiruzen. No, it can't be, Hiruzen denied. How, Jiraiya, how could you let this happen? What was I supposed to do, Sensei, camp outside his door? Follow him around for the rest of my days? Jiraiya said with a laugh. Just for once listen to me, let this go. Has everyone forgotten what she's done? Those cruel, sadistic experiments? Her complete betrayal? I have not but here's the problem, she did those in full view of Danzo. That's the kick in the nuts, sensei. It's not that no one cares, or that we aren't mortified. It's that you want to condemn her when you permitted your former rival to do as he pleased. Even after he ordered the genocide of a founding clan makes you look like a hypocrite. That's before you add in the whole banging her and coerced abortion aspects. I'm going to save you a few trips to Anoichi, Sensei. What she did she did. And you know what? I'm guessing part of the motivation was she knew you'd eventually find out and carry the guilt and the pain of her fall. You resent her for doing it, you hate her for doing it to get back at you, and you despise her for rejecting that which you find most sacred, the will of fire. She desecrated it. But the thing that eats at you, the thoughts that keep you up at night, all center around one idea. One scenario you wish to deem impossible. What if she changes? What if she changes for and because of Naruto? What if they are actually happy together? Then your role in why she broke bad is undeniable and you can't cast her as the one true villain. Get over yourself. If she does something, we'll catch her. If not, my godson is happy and I won't have that threatened. It's not in your control, and it's not your job. Enjoy your retirement, and try not to alienate Naruto, even more than you already have. Jiraiya stood up and exited after his words, hoping Hiruzen would listen just this once. There were very few things, Kabuto disliked about his mistress. She'd allowed him to indulge in his sadism and scientific curiosities without judgment, so he felt duty-bound to be no less accepting of her. However, every time he heard her giggle, Kabuto wanted to murder a specific redhead. 
It just wasn't right. Nor was her spending hours, playing with iron sand. They had real breakthroughs to attend to, real science to conduct. Just the thought of it made him adjust his glasses. Naruto Uzumaki was the bane of his existence. This fact was made all the more galling as the boy didn't even know how ruinous he'd been to Kabuto's life, how fraying he'd been to Kabuto's only real tether. She came back to the village for him. Dulled her edge for him. Limited her work for him. It was infuriating, and now because he tried to remove the boy and his taint from Orochimaru-sama Kabuto was stuck. Forced to betray her, to shamelessly cling to life, just for the chance to make things right. Spying for the Sandame was just below killing Nono as his most reprehensible act. Not just for the treason, though that would have been sufficient. The extra sting was through his observation, he realized how much Orochimaru had started keeping from him. She suspected him of something, and was freezing him out. Kabuto's inquisitiveness and lack of boundaries pushed him to want to know, he needed to know her secrets. Just beyond his conscious mind, a small voice would sometimes whisper to Kabuto that had the Sandame not ordered him to spy the medical ninja would have done so anyway. The silver-haired young man was closer now. He'd taken Orochimaru's absence as a chance to go through her study. Looking through every book he'd finally found a break, a biometric seal that likely opened up the passage to her secret facility. The medic took several pictures of the seal, making sure not to include anything that could reveal its origin. He needed help, Kabuto only understood the most basic of Fuinjutsu, but he was lucky he had a willing pawn. A silly, little girl that led with her emotions. Kabuto would never allow himself to think his well-hidden disdain for Karen might parallel some even deeper buried sentiments, for Orochimaru-sama. It was easy to manipulate the Uzumaki medic. She was all too willing to please him. He showed just a little interest, and she clung to him like driftwood in the middle of the ocean. She was pathetic, but useful. It took no effort to trick her into deciphering the seals. However long it took for her Kabuto would wait. And once he gained entrance, once he knew all there was to know he'd make things right. Somehow, some way. Okay, that's enough, Naruto spoke and chuckled when he saw the relief in Hanabi's eyes. Before he could train his student, he needed to know her limits, so their training session was meant to do just that. It was only thanks to his experience with Kanoamaru, Moegi, and Udon, he even had an inkling as what his expectations should be. Hanabi was about where they all were at her age. He could certainly work with that. Tomorrow, we'll start on your new taijutsu, and maybe get you a weapon so be thinking about that. Why a weapon, Naruto-sensei? Because you're short and weak, Naruto said without missing a beat, causing Hanabi to faceplant. When she returned to her feet, he saw her look of indignation, but cut her off, before she could speak. I was short and weak once, as well. Unfortunately, not everyone you'll ever fight will share your measurements and skill level. Weapons even things out. So, what will you be doing tonight? Thinking of potential weapons I want to learn? Hanabi asked. Good answer. Enjoy the rest of your day, Hanabi. Same to you, Sensei, the Hyuga said back, politely. Naruto exited the training grounds, and saw Hyuga waiting in the corridor. Hayashi-sama would like to speak to you, the Hyuga said, and Naruto nodded, and followed the man. As he was led through a parade of similar-looking corridors, Naruto emptied his mind. He didn't want to go into this exchange with any expectations or assumptions. Tsunade requested he not create a political incident, and he'd do his level, best, not to. Finally, Naruto was ushered into a courtyard, where Hayashi was sitting. Uzumaki-san, Hayashi said an acknowledgement, but never took his eyes off the small garden in front of him. Please join me, he requested, and Naruto walked over to the man, taking a seat. Ko, you are dismissed, thank you, Hayashi said, and the now-named Ko departed. Hyuga-san, Naruto said in return. The pair sat in silence for several moments until Hayashi chose to speak once more. What is it to be free, Naruto? I don't think I'm the right person to ask that question to, Naruto answered, and meant it. Naruto's fate had been tied to the village since the night he was born, and only extreme action would have changed that. In all likelihood, for Naruto to be free of the village, he'd have become something tyrannical in exchange. No matter his antipathy toward Kanoha's residence or the suite of negative emotions he held for the old man, mass slaughter was never something he wanted. It is because of your unique position, I think you are the very best person to ask this question to. My brother and my firstborn only found freedom in death, that's how constricting and limiting they found being a Hyuga. It is only in retrospect that I saw my role in their suffering. Maybe that sounds familiar. 
Naruto nodded at that last statement as it did sound a lot like the old man, casting himself as powerless when he was anything but. I was raised to value the Hyuga way. I believed, and believe, it kept me strong. During the war, shouldering the burdens of being a clan head, losing my wife. I leaned on those traditions, to prop me up when I felt nothing else could. They were my pillars of support. Somewhere at some point, I came to believe the Hyuga way was the only path, that it could only be failed, but never fail anyone. I alienated my eldest daughter, because of it. I didn't encourage her, only pointing out what I deemed her flaws. And when I realized she saw me for who, and what I was, I resented her for it. I loved her, but I resented her all the same. And then she was taken from me. She died a hero, protecting her team, but I'd much rather have her here. I'm sure that too is something you are familiar with. I asked Tsunade-sama personally to let you be Hanabi's tutor. I may not be able to walk down her chosen path with her, but I'll do whatever I can to make sure she's as prepared as she can be. Whatever she wants to learn, there will be no clan restrictions, so teach at your own discretion, and if you need anything from me, or the clan, don't hesitate to ask. Naruto didn't really know what to say to the man that had just bared his soul, to him. His pain, his regret were palpable. It reminded Naruto of someone else, a man of tradition, and standing that only amended his ways after irreparably failing his daughter too. During my travels, I met another man who faced something similar. He couldn't cast off his traditions for his daughter, and the pain of her loss changed him. For what it's worth, you're handling it better than he did, Naruto shared with the Hyuga leader. What makes you say that? Hayashi asked. Because that man's path led him to the end of my sword, Naruto answered. As for Hanabi, I'll do my best to give her the tools, to follow her ambition, and prepare her for life as a ninja. It's all I can ask. Thank you, Naruto, Hayashi said. Naruto nodded and then left, via Shunshin. Naruto didn't exactly pity the Hyuga leader, but he wasn't devoid of sympathy either. Regret could be a corrective or could be poison. He'd also almost been swallowed whole by it, a wrong call, during a mission. He was fortunate he had Bagheera and Majila to keep his head on straight, and then his team to see him the rest of the way. Sigh, Naruto thought but it wasn't due to his previous topic of rumination, but the kunai that was hurtling toward his head. The Uzumaki caught the multi-use knife by the handle, and then shot a board look to the owner of said projectile. You know, if you'd pulled this three years ago, you'd have a pissed off Jinchuriki, trying to kill you, Naruto said. Ah, don't be mad. I just wanted to challenge my fellow discipline is all, Anko replied, though a part of her was grateful she didn't have a rampaging Jinchuriki after her head. The snake summoner watched for any signs of hostility, which allowed her to catch the kunai he'd thrown back to her. Oh. Couldn't you have just asked, Tabeo? That's boring. So, what do you say? Wanna find out who's the stronger student of the snake Sanin? Anko asked with a playful smirk, but frowned when she saw the Uzumaki shake his head. I'd spar with you for fun or whatever, I'm up for making new friends. Fighting to see which of us is stronger, though, is a waste of time. It's me, Naruto said with a shrug. And what makes you so sure of that? Being a container doesn't make you invincible, Anko argued back with a bit of heat. Then she felt. Off. Her heart raced and her knees shook, and she felt like her skin falling from her bones. It went from panic-inducing to visceral agony in seconds. You didn't even know you were under my jinjutsu, Anko, so you certainly don't know how long you've been open for my attack. Anko stopped her chakra circulation, seeking to disrupt the flow. She held it and then performed the jinjutsu kai technique. As she did, the Naruto in front of her dissolved and Anko stood in the street alone. Once her breathing came back under control, Anko smiled. The annoyance at having been dismissed, given way to anticipation. He may have gotten the better of her just then, but it was only round one. Naruto continued on to his destination. He wondered if Anko managed to deduce how he activated his Jinjutsu. He doubted it. Channeling the chakra through her kunai wasn't a common practice, so she likely wouldn't think her catching it was the triggering event. He didn't know a lot about his fellow special Jounin, but he assumed she wouldn't be deterred by his trick. He wouldn't mind it, though. He arrived at his destination, being welcomed by the ice cream scooper. Hey Naruto, welcome back, the Daily Scoop employee said. The brunette had known Naruto for years, him coming into the shop as a chubby-cheeked boy just wanting to be treated fairly. Thanks, Yuri-san, Naruto replied. What can I get for you today? 
I'm going to have the butter pecan, two scoops in a waffle cone. I would also like two scoops of Rocky Road in a bowl. Oh, do you have someone joining you? Is it that adorable little panther? Majila? No, not today. She's also not so little anymore. Neither are you, time is funny like that, Yuri I said as she was preparing his order. I suppose, Naruto said. He took his order and grabbed a seat at the marble counter. He didn't have to wait long for his guest to arrive. The atmosphere in the room changed when she entered, though her face showed no sign she noticed or cared. Naruto wondered if she were truly apathetic or fainted to secretly increase her enjoyment. Naruto-kun, she said while taking a seat, beside the Uzumaki. You have really good timing, Naruto said. What can I say, I am a woman of many talents. Humble too, Naruto observed. Humility is for farmers and monks, Naruto-kun. I will never pretend to be less than what I am out of some notion of social desirability, I hope you wouldn't either. False humility isn't my bag, but I was very much in need of humbling, at one point. Thankfully, it was Bagheera who set me straight as it possibly saved my life. Now though? Naruto shrugged, I don't have that same need for external validation. I know who I am and what I can do. As long as you don't become meek, the Sanin replied. I don't think I could pull of meek anyway, I'm so obviously impressive. Orochimaru gave him a once-over, yes, quite obvious, she said, and then finally tried the ice cream in front of her. She couldn't help it, her face, completely betrayed how good she found the frozen treat. When she looked back to Naruto, she wanted to wipe that smug, knowing grin off his face, even if she did find it cute. Naruto soon returned to his own treat, elated he'd made a good choice. Anko challenged me today. Wanted to see which of your students was the superior ninja, Naruto said. Oh? Yep, threw a kunai at my head and everything, Naruto added. Is she still alive? Orochimaru asked, knowing about his rule against unprovoked attacks from the villagers. Naruto laughed. Of course. I didn't harm a hair on her head, though, I'll probably have to fight her, so the surprise attacks to ramp up. Kukuku, yes, Enkochan can be quite tenacious. The two continued to chat, even as they departed the ice cream parlor and headed to her home. So, you wanted to take me there as it was part of your plan? Arachi asked. I wanted to take you there, because they treated me like a normal person, and I thought you would like it. Your enjoyment made it the first step of my plan. Which is now abandoned, she observed as she headed towards her door, but noticed Naruto had stopped moving behind her. She turned to see a puzzled look on his face. What makes you think it's abandoned, he asked, closing the distance between them. Last night, Dash. Was just incentive to be more diligent. Sorry, plan's already in motion, and there's no stopping it now, Naruto said lowly, their faces mere inches apart. Hmm, we shall see. You coming in? It would save me the trouble of breaking in tonight, he answered softly, close enough to feel her smile. Yes, that energy could be put to better use, Orochi said as she opened the door while never turning away from Naruto, swiftly pulling him into a kiss. Naruto returned the gesture, one-upping the infamous Sanin, by wrapping his arms around her and lifting her up. Orochimaru wrapped her legs around her fiery-haired lover as Naruto carried her inside, closing the door behind them with his foot. No one would see the two for the rest of the day. Darui sighed, in boredom. The trip had been dull. The need to move in absolute secret not only made it a longer trek, but he could go nowhere nor do anything interesting. It was one of the realities of being designated the rakage second, his essential man. Darui's movements drew notice, spies of the four great hidden villages, and even some minor ones would be interested in where he went and why. So, this had to be as clandestine as possible. It didn't help that Darui was doing something he categorically didn't believe in. The person he was meeting was located on the coast, the campfire illuminating the lush forest that stood behind the elder man. He noticed Darui and the Kumo Jounin could feel those yellow eyes analyzing him, taking his measure, but the Storm-style user didn't care to delay this any more than necessary. The rakage has agreed to your stipulations, Shinosan, Darui announced. The prisoners will be provided to you five days, before your attack. Ha ha ha, excellent. Then he will have my cooperation, Kanoha will fall and in its ashes, the land of sky will rise once again, Shino said, sinister grin visible in the light of the fire. The pair would iron out more specifics, before Darui departed. It was only after he was sure the Kumo ninja was out of the vicinity, did the third person in attendance reveal himself, emerging from the ground. 
You were right about letting Kumo find me, Zetsu-san. They are going to give me everything I need to not only crush Kanoha, but them as well. Yes, and once you do you can become the Sky Emperor you were always meant to be, just as I told you when you were a boy. With the power of the Zero Tails, I'll be unstoppable and lord over all from the sky. Like a god. Yes, but first Kanoha must fall and two members, in particular, cannot survive this attack. Tell me their names and I will see them dead. Uchiha Sasuke and Uzumaki Naruto.